Okay. Um, Thanks, Liam. Okay, because we got the information. All right. Um, the title is nominally rotating detonation, but I'm going to talk about some of the other cycles uh, as well briefly. And there's uh, really two themes that I decided that is going to cover this. Um, the unsteady versus steady business is exists in the rotating detonation at the same time. I will show you how that works. Uh, you might have noticed that I like uh, retro titles, um, and they seem to work best. Many words and too many scientific papers are too long to read. Uh, and then I'm going to add um, some of reality as we go along. We're going to get a taste of the thermodynamics, but I'm not going to go that deep into it. Uh, there are questions. We can pursue those later. Uh, so, um, I'm going to skip most of the personal stuff, which you already know, but I'm going to mention um, some of the inspirations that pushed me along this direction. Uh, way back when I was in uh, high school and junior high school, I was introduced to Asimov's Foundation Trilogy, which has a connection to thermodynamics in its inspiration itself. So. I was reading that about the same time I was taking high school physics, and this is going to date me, but at the same time, the Mercury space program was operative. And I also had an encounter with um, zinc sulfur uh, uh, fuel. Um, it was used in some amateur rockets. Um, fortunately, um, my uh, parents' homeowner's insurance uh, covered the damage, so I won't go into details on that. Uh, that was the source, I think, of uh, some of my inspiration. Audio on that? Uh, uh, was the sound of, uh, if you could hear that, that's the sound of uh, an RDE being fired at the um, Air Force Research Lab. What a rotating detonation is, uh, number one, it's a pressure gain combustion device. Um, it's a complete thermodynamic cycle. There's no moving parts in it. We've uh, in detonation wave to go around in an annulus. Uh, and as it goes, it does work on the air. So as a cycle, the compression, combustion, expansion is all packed together and confined to this uh, uh, this gerbil cage that we put it in. Uh, this particular uh, device is a three inch device. It operates at about 6,000 hertz. Uh, and the wave tangential speed is uh, in, in the order of Mach 4 or 5. Uh, so, what was it good for? Um, Benjamin Franklin was an eyewitness to the first launch of the. Uh, uh, Montgolfier Brothers hot air balloon and uh, Charles and Robert's hydrogen balloon uh, way back 1783. And he says, what is the use of a newborn child? And that's kind of where the development of the RDE stands. We're still trying to figure this out. So the usual suspects are rockets. Um, the Japanese are working on putting an RDE in the upper stage of the sounding rocket. They've been trying to launch this thing for the last couple of years, but have been delayed for a variety of reasons. So uh, any day now, I guess they're going to launch, but we don't really know. Uh, there's been proposals for uh, scramjets um, and a lot of work uh, to adapt the RDE as a burner for gas turbines. This is a concept from Purdue, the Air Force lab in Dayton. Uh, has a small uh, uh, T6 turbine um, that they've adapted to run off of the RDE. And uh, you can see the uh, uh, inlet guide vanes of the turbine uh, glowing red hot from the RDE exhaust. So the turbines are uh, a big deal for uh, this community. Um, the Nobody has flown an RDE yet. What has been flown as a pulse detonation engine, 
that has driven this aircraft, which is currently in the U.S. Air Force Museum in Ohio. There are a number of detonation engine types. Uh, we're still discovering how to configure this. These are some of the ones that we know of so far. Um, this is the typical uh, type of RDE. It's a annular chamber um, where the combustion occurs in this area. There's a nozzle up here. It can operate without a nozzle and still generate thrust. There are different types of nozzles. This is spike, uh, aerospike nozzle, and this is a conventional uh, co uh, convergent divergent nozzle. Fuel and air comes in the bottom and burns in that area and runs around uh, uh, the center line going up to the middle. There's a lot of interest in this so-called radial RDE, where the flow uh, and radially uh, both from the outside or from the inside. The outside um, RDE, the one on the top, has a specific interest uh, by the Air Force is uh, working on a design to stick a radial turbine in the middle of that. And this is the cross-section of that uh, d device. Um, it's also a hollow or centerless RDE where the center body uh, component, which you see up in this uh, area, is simply removed, and you simply have a hollow cylindrical um, uh, uh, combustion chamber, and with the correct injection, uh, a uh, detonation wave can and be induced to, to run around that. So uh, that means one less component to cool, and uh, there's a lot, some work being done on this. Uh, the Chinese have a, a, a good deal of work uh, done on this. So this is a uh, the backside of the Air Force uh, PDE-driven airplane. Uh, I'm going to show another picture of that later. Uh, there's a, uh, a device called a wave rotor, which is related, uh, but I won't be talking about that just to make you aware of it. And there is work ongoing on uh, oblique uh, detonation wave engines uh, to set them up something like this. Uh, this is uh, not as advanced as some of the work done on the rotating detonation engine. And there's work uh, that is being done trying to get an RDE uh, to go hypersonic. We don't really know what that looks like, so we're going to show the X-51 for illustrations and pretend that that's being driven by an RDE. Um, it's important because historically, every new useful heat cycle defined you look at all the major uh, engine cycles, uh, they have enabled a range uh, improvement in of the order of a, of a whole uh, order of magnitude. The horses to sail, you go from 20 to 40 miles to up to 400 miles a day, which was held by the clipper ships. Once you've got steam into the picture, you're going uh, 700 miles a day on uh, some of these steamers. Uh, I'm leaving out the diesel, but uh, the, the, the auto piston engine with airplanes uh, were going 5,000 miles a day on the Lockheed Super Constellation. Once we got into the jet age, uh, we're now capable of going 11,000 miles. That's the current record held by uh, an A A350 assuming you want to sit in an airplane for 19 hours. And with the rockets, of course, uh, now we, we've gone to the boat and we're upwards of 52,000 miles a day. We don't know that the rotating detonation is going to um, add to this list or not, but we're, um, we're selling this as having potential of 1% to 20% increase of efficiency, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. A couple of challenges to having a new cycle. If you look at a list of available cycles right off of Wikipedia, only four out of those 11 cycles, and I've added the detonation cycles, they are world changers. The Rankin cycle, the Brighton, the diesel, and the auto. 
some of these other cycles are interesting, but they have not changed the world uh, in the, at the level that the other ones have. The development time can be a little discouraging. The Brayton cycle, first patent, gas turbine, uh, turbine patent was 1791. The first self-sustaining cycle was 1903, about the same time as Wright Brothers by Elling in Norway. Uh, and the first to flight was von Ohain in 1939. So there's 36 years from uh, getting it to run at all uh, to the first flight. Um, the first RDEs to fire was in 1959 uh, in Russia and at the University of Michigan. So here we are 61 years later, uh, the first fire and the first RDE has not flown. But I think we're right on schedule. Um, and the lesson is from Arthur Clark, who was talking specifically about the space elevator. And he says, the space elevator will be built 50 years after everyone stops laughing. So I, I think we're right on target, but it can be discouraging. And I would re ask you as students to think about this question. Do you want something solvable or something interesting? That seems to be the choice. Um, from my perspective, an engineer might have a chance to work on a new cycle once in 50 years. So uh, I think this is potentially a big deal. Uh, this is what I would call the infinite plane sandwich model of a detonation. Uh, it's a one-dimensional planar model. You have a shock out front that extends to infinity in all directions. It's moving through space at a detonation velocity. It, the shock will pressurize uh, the uh, reactants, uh, raise the pressure and temperature and uh, density, and the uh, induction zone where all the free radicals get organized. Uh, and a reaction zone where the combustion actually happens, uh, and then that passes through a thermal choke, and then there's an expansion. The expansion and the resulting thrust and momentum exchange from that propels everything forward. So it's very, very similar to a ramjet in this sense. This model is accurate only in the most general sense, but is the basis of what we call the Z and D model. And C stands for um, uh, Zeldovich, von Neumann, and Doring. We have a Russian, an American, and a German that came to the same conclusion in the 1940s as to constitutes a detonation. This is a PV diagram, uh, uh, volume, uh, non-dimensional volume on the x-axis, pressure on the y. And it's nominalized to the upstream value of one uh, for reference pressure and, uh, and density. So anything above one is a pressure gain combustor. Anything below it is a pressure loss combustion. That would include the Brayton cycle. Uh, there's two curves that are important. Um, one is the shock Hugonio, and the other one is the Hugonio. They're basically the same curve uh, using all the conservation laws. Uh, the difference is the amount of heat that you added in combustion. So these bound all of the, the standard cycles, the constant pressure cycle here, the constant volume here, all wind up on the same curve. The detonation cycle has this curve of the Hugonio, which is all possible states, but it approximates a shock. If you're going in this direction, you hit a max uh, pressure up here, the von Neumann point, by the way, he's the same guy that worked on the atomic bomb, so he put his fingers on a lot of different uh, sciences. There's a straight line that connects this point, this tangency, and this point called Raleigh line, uh, where the heat addition occurs along this line until you get to this uh, thermal choke. This is the best thermodynamic model anybody has for a detonation. Um, we can get within maybe 5% error of predicting the wave speed of the detonation. But you have to know that this captures a lot of first order average properties. There's a lot of deviations from the average, but there is also no consensus on the more advanced models. So this is as good as our thermodynamic model gets at this level of detail.
showed that uh, during my dissertation, uh, we modeled this and we uh, created some streamlines so we could track the properties through the RDE. And lo and behold, it fits uh, this model more or less. Here's the theoretical model and the Raleigh line. And these streamlines are following the general shape of that uh, with an offset and getting up here. And then the expansion uh, continues down through these lines. Uh, you can see some kinks in the line, and that is a, me um, a metric of the grid size that we're using. So between each of these kinks in the line, you're going from grid to grid. There's only uh, maybe two to three or four maybe uh, uh, grid cells uh, that actually model the thickness of the. So that is likely uh, responsible for some of the deviation from the, uh, uh, from the Z and D model. Uh, oh, what is a detonation? If you take that infinite sandwich and you just kind of shove it through space, you might think that I could wrap a tube around it and make an engine out of it. But it's not going to work very well for a couple or three reasons. Uh, one, you're going to find out that a standing detonation, uh, which I've created in this tube, is going to be less efficient than a Burton Ranjet. Uh, and the reason for that is that a normal shock is not a very good compressor at all. Uh, at Mach 5, uh, I'm getting about 6% of pressure recovery. Uh, you can crank that up to 50% if you work with an oblique shock, which has actually created um, an evolutionary branch of the detonation engine. Uh, Ellie Debora, uh, this, uh, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, worked on this some years ago, and uh, uh, there is ongoing work at the University of Central Florida on this sort of engine. So this is um, of interest to some people as well. There's not as much research done on this device as on the uh, rotating detonation or the pulse detonation. Uh, second reason is that this high Mach um, inlet type increases the shock entropy. There's a rather complex uh, thermodynamic argument. But uh, what it means is that you want to slow that uh, air down in the inlet in order to reduce that factor. Uh, and there's a stability issue with this. You've got to match the airspeed with the wave speed. And uh, that's going to be really, really difficult. What we can do is we can put this detonation in the tube and make a pulse detonation, uh, fill it full of a reactant, light it off from one end and let the pulse, uh, the detonation travel from one end to the other. And when the detonation pops out the other end, uh, the resulting gases that have been pressurized and energized with a certain amount of kinetic energy uh, will create thrust and this will work. It solves the second problem of the high mop uh, inlet, and it looks simple. It's just a pipe, right? So take a close look at the Air Force pulse detonation driven uh, Borealis. Um, the pipes are simple, but the rest of the equipment that you need to feed are not so simple. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see a automotive uh, valve train that has been commandeered to uh, help feed these uh, uh, these pipes, but it does work and it works reasonably well. They had a 30 second flight and then they put it in the museum. So the bulk of the current um, pressure gain combustion research right now is RDEs. And the reason is that the PDEs, uh, they can't operate very well at frequencies greater than 100 hertz. The one you just saw, each tube was running at about 20 hertz. They have to be filled. There's a cycle involved with uh, filling and exhausting. Um, the RDEs are on the order of six kilohertz. And what it means is that there's a higher power density and that's got everybody's attention right now. The flow is continuous. There's no mechanical valves, simple geometry. The cycles are essentially the same with some significant differences. And some of the differences, um, 
there's a thing that well, might be useful in other studies called the Galilean transform, where you can go from a fixed frame coordinate system to a moving frame coordinate system using this vector equation. On the PDE, uh, for one dimensional, you get something that looks like this on the exhaust side of the PDE, where the, the U wave is going in one direction, the relative flow is going in the other, and the resulting gas velocity is a, is a, is a function of um, the summation. In the 3D, you get something that the gas turbine people will call a velocity triangle. And we have found that this is uh, extremely helpful in understanding what is going on in the RDE. Uh, there's keys that we found to be useful, and that is the turbo machinery equation, uh, the integrated form, rather, you may be familiar with, if, you, if you've studied uh, gas turbines, you might be familiar with the form where you're looking at the change in stagnation enthalpy versus the change in gas velocity or the turning, as it were. This term is a, is a dot vector product uh, in its full derivation. And there's a constant uh, of integration out here, which is our conserved energy. It may surprise you that stagnation enthalpy in the RDE is not conserved, but this constant of integration is conserved. If I take the uh, Galilean transform and uh, rewrite it to this form and stuff it into this term and the one half V squared term in the stagnation enthalpy, I can boil it down to this, uh, where this is the stagnation enthalpy in the moving frame. So my kinetic energy is now the uh, one V squared. And this is uh, a kinetic energy, a term associated with the wave. Well, if U is constant, and my stagnation enthalpy is conserved in the moving frame, and this is constant, everything is constant and everything adds up. And being this as the conserved term, this is where my heat addition shows up in the thermodynamic. So we're taking something from the turbo machinery and we're finding that it is very applicable to either the RDE or the PDE. And this is good news because it means that you can analyze this uh, using the tools that you already have in the books. So how does it work? Um, this is what I would call a plus vanilla RDE. It's unwrapped. We have periodic boundary conditions at either end. So it's like an old fashioned video game where if you disappear off the right hand side of the screen, you're going to reappear over here. We have ideal boundary conditions on the inlet, meaning that uh, any Pressure drop in the injectors is math modeled mathematically. We don't model any back. Um, it's simply an, an equation that sits as a boundary condition. And we do much the same thing at the, at the exhaust, where we're exhausting due to some ambient condition. So once this gets going, uh, it creates a wave that looks like this. We have a triangular fill zone of un burned reactants. The detonation sits along this line and is a very thin uh, uh, model. You, you might have a dozen or so cells that uh, include the shock and the combustion. Uh, so you won't really see it in this scale. What you will see is everything else, which is the expansion. All, all the rest of the flow is the part, expansion part of the cycle. These are transverse waves. They bounce back up and down. I'll show you another uh, version of that. Uh, as the flow goes through here, it circles back around, and it runs into this oblique shock. So we have older burned uh, re uh, products over here, I'm trying to mix with younger uh, burned products, and it creates this shear layer uh, that creates this very nice shedding vortex uh, shear and is uh, part of the mechanism that creates this oblique shock. There's a triple point right here uh, between the oblique shock, the detonation shock, and it creates this other shock that is another secondary characteristic. The device is actually quite clever uh, without us realizing it. It's a fluidic 
device, as the detonation moves across the injection plane, the high pressure shuts off the flow because of the high pressure of the detonation. As the, the wave expands, the pressure drops, and eventually the flow restarts. And that's why you get this triangular fill zone. Uh, and you can see this, this front here leans over a little bit, and it's moving upstream against the streamline of reactants. It's following its food like a good beastie will uh, do. So if we take a time averaging of all of that, we can get rid of some of those pesky little um, perturbations and just look at the general properties and drop streamlines in here. And you can see the streamlines in the fill zone going nicely up here. I picked uh, one that's representative. So this, if you follow a particle up through the, uh, uh, in the frame, in the moving frame of reference, you run through the detonation in this area, and then you start to expand up through here, and then out the door through here. So we're fo actually following the velocity along this W, uh, this relative wind uh, vector. I don't see the vector that is the actual fluid flow. This is the unsteady flow. This is what I mentioned before. The this fluid flow um, is a function of time. This tire pattern is moving with the wave at 6,000 uh, hertz. Uh, so in this moving frame of reference, the W is our steady flow. The unsteady flow V, it's really difficult to measure if you put a sensor in there, you're going to see uh, a lot of fluctuation. I'll show you a pressure trace later. It's hard to analyze, and it's, um, uh, but it makes thrust. This is this V is what's going to make thrust for you and get useful work out of it. The streamlines they're also very difficult to measure. Not impossible. You can do it with uh, uh, inter uh, particle um, a PIV. Uh, velocimetry, um, but it's easier to analyze and it's easier to think about it in this form. So it's also a lesson if you've got other problems, choose your coordinate system and your inertial frame uh, wisely. Uh, and that's what we've done here and it works out pretty well. We've stolen all of these tools from the gas turbine world and they work in this problem. Um, that stability problem I mentioned, by the way, in that first uh, attempt at making a detonation machine, this velocity triangle in the uh, fill zone is self-adjusting. If anything changes, this velocity triangle will adjust itself, uh, and it has the freedom to do that. So. One of the difficulties is getting accurate measurements uh, out of this. And at the exhaust plane, we have a high frequency oscillating swirl of the velocity coming out. These lines represent the local velocity. And they're angled off in some direction. And this pattern moves with the wave. And if I put a sensor in that, we're going to see um, the sensor react uh, with all the pressures and temperatures that are going to vary along with this. So uh, it goes through a reversal of the swirl, this uh, azimuthal um, component uh, to the swirl twice each cycle for each wave. Once here where the oblique wave crosses, and once here we're into the expansion portion of it. Um, and it creates a an issue with angular momentum. But when you look at the angular momentum, um, it's balanced. The angular momentum is balanced across this entire field, and the oblique shock helps balance that. So uh, this is important uh, to realize because it is not going to generate a torque on the, um, on the, uh, uh, the chamber. Um, I also want to mention that this particular simulation was done by Dan Paxson at Matt Glenn. And he did a very clever thing. He was very frustrated with uh, the long uh, computational times it gets to, it takes to get a really detailed uh, model going. You need 
parallel. You need a bank of computers. Uh, and he was very frustrated with this. So he went off and he developed his own CFD code. He wrote it in Fortran, of all things. And he said, I don't care about the details. I just want to get the general picture. So he's working with a very coarse grid. And he can run this on his laptop, and it takes him, I think, maybe 10 minutes to make a run and create a picture like this. But he doesn't get the fine detail in some of the, the pictures, but he gets enough information to understand what's going on. And he's done some very good work with this model. So here's uh, the, the stickiest part of the thermodynamics uh, is an HS figure. Um, the entropy and uh, enthalpy uh, along the axis. The Brayton cycle is compared here. It's very simple. You got a compressive uh, compression, uh, heat addition along uh, this uh, this line, and then expansion, and turn to ambient. The detonation starts at the same point for a comparable uh, cycle. We compress we pre-compress it to the same amount, and th this model I think is ten to one. Here's the shock, uh, the von Neumann maximum peak pressure. And then we have our heat addition up through here and then expansion down through here. Now, it is true the shock is a very lousy compressor, maybe 30% thermal efficiency. Um, and that's probably pushing it. Uh, but the heat addition makes up and you get a net I lost my cursor here. You get a net uh, increase in the exergy of the useful work. The um, I don't know where my cursor went. Okay, we'll talk through it. The uh, the orange uh, line where I'm adding the heat addition to the was above the heat addition line that you have for the Brayton cycle. And if you know these cycles, you would ask the question, why am I getting all this extra energy? Is this magic or what it is? It's not magic and it's not extra energy. Above that line is unrecoverable energy. That expansion that goes from where I marked the upper CJ point down to that line, uh, the or orange arrow, along with the expansion that occurs while you're burning, is work that goes into the shock. So that's kind of analogous to work in a gas turbine that is routed through the shaft of a gas turbine into the compressor. So I have to steal that work uh, to get the gas turbine to work at all. And you don't see that as part of the useful work that comes out the back end. So the two red lines you can compare and say, uh, that's as much work um, as I'm getting out of the Brayton cycle. And you can see that the detonation is much bigger than that. So uh, that's where this extra energy, it's all about the entropy. If you can, if you can reduce the entropy, you can get uh, the performance. So we can confirm this model uh, with the street lines again. And you can see the ideal, uh, uh, the gray line is the ideal Z and D model. And the uh, multitude of black lines are each streamline. There's 20 lines that I put in the model. And they, for the most part, follow uh, that. There are some extra little cycles in there because we have, um, we have the oblique shock that acts some entropy, and we have some deflagration that occurs along that other side of the fill zone. Because we have um, hot products that are uh, in contact with the cold reactants, and there's deflagration along that. Somewhere between 5 and 20% uh, of the flow actually uh, gets uh, burned in that manner. This little triangular shape down on the left, which I'm pointing to and saying injection delta P is actually one of the biggest problems that we have uh, in developing it. Um, we, the community is now approaching the point where they're just about uh, able to demonstrate a pressure gain. 
And that's kind of discouraging because they've been working at it for over 10 years. But it's also understandable when you look at the details of actually doing that. And uh, we'll talk about that a little in another slide. Based of uh, reality. Uh, two traces that we got off of this particular rig. Uh, the raw data is up at the upper left. Um, the uh, pressure signal has all manner of dirt in it. There's thermal drift. There's signal jumps. Some of the sensors are almost dead. Uh, there are six channels here. The top two channels in that list, you can see the top one is almost total hash, but there's actually some uh, useful information. On that. Uh, channel six is on its way to dying, and then the rest of them are typically what you see when you put a pressure sensor in one of these guys. Uh, large spike followed by uh, more or less an exponential uh, pressure decay. And you can see that the wave shapes are not quite all the same. There's one pickup in channel three. We don't know what happened there, but it's there. Uh, and then if you do a um, fast Fourier transfer model, you get these uh, six plots on the bottom. And out, you know, uh, you could pick up easily in a, in a clear signal the uh, primary frequency. And because you have this impulse uh, of the, uh, the wave, you get these harmonics. I counted 20 harmonics in this particular set. Most of them kind of disappear into the mud. Uh, at the high end, we're getting uh, sensor resonance. And all of these signals show a tremendous amount of background noise. So that is coming from things like uh, the transverse waves and uh, other freak, uh, waves that are probably bouncing around in there loose. So uh, getting the signals on something like this is this is a research area all by itself. Uh, the shocks tend to beat up the, uh, the sensors. Uh, they don't last very long. And this, these particular sensors, uh, I think, cost about $1,000 a piece. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work trying to find alternate ways of measuring uh, the performance. Uh, same with the thermocouples. They get beat up a lot. Uh, so there's work trying to find a reliable uh, way to, to measure temperature. Here's a, another little piece of reality. Um, this study is a, uh, what's called a channel detonation. We have a basically an infinitely long channel. Uh, and my partner in crime, uh, Doug Schwer, does this down at Naval Research. Uh, he's running a hydrogen oxygen argon simulation. The argon is to deliberately slow the detonation down so they can study the, all of this fine structure. And this, uh, pretty clean example of what actually is going on in the detonation front itself. And you can see that there's a lot going on. This is not this anything like that uh, infinitely plain sandwich model that I showed you before. Those green areas are the induction zone where all of the free radicals get themselves organized. Uh, there's a little explosion that happens uh, when the waves collide and starts this bubble all over again. And it goes through a cycle. So this is a very, very dynamic environment. The front, depending on what part of the front, you're talking about the bubble or that, that flat area in between, it's either accelerating or it's decelerating. It's steady only on average. And we can make this picture because in the model, velocity has been set at the wave velocity, the average wave velocity. So uh, in terms of modeling this, um, what you see is the entire grid uh, model. And we can get this infinite tube simply by uh, cranking in an artificial velocity for the upstream uh, uh, flow. Um, we can, if you look at all of this detail and you say, well, if it's accelerating and decelerating, this, the chemistry and the dynamics is not in equilibrium. So this is a very dynamic beast and trying to model this is 
not easy. And it's a wonder that the Z&D model works as well as it does. The, on the bottom is a digital smoke coil trace, uh, tracing where the max pressure occurs. You can do this with actual smoke foils and is traditionally done um, by putting a smoke foil in a pipe and uh, letting a detonation rip down the tube. And the width of these diamond-shaped areas is uh, used as a cell size. And this is a, a, a characteristic of the particular chemistry. Uh, it's a function of pressure and temperature and also of geometry because there's resonance uh, that can be deduced by the boundary conditions of the walls. You see the, in the animation that, and in the smoke file that it's uh, bouncing against the uh, upper and lower walls of the boundary condition. So uh, this is going on in the front of the rotating detonation at all. So uh, it's uh, an extremely dynamic environment. Uh, Doug and I figured out that uh, we, had a, we had a restriction on our research, which was funded by the Air Force. And we were told that do all you want with the basic thermodynamics, but there's an area we want you to stay away from. And that is actually modeling an injector. Um, aside from the fact that it complicates your life as a modeler to model the injection. And it's the reason everybody usually has an ideal injection along the injection boundary. But the real reason is that the injector designs are considered ITAR, the International uh, uh, Arms Reduction um, uh, Treaty that signed by most nations in the world. So uh, certain technologies, including a number of gas turbine technologies, and with this case, uh, the injectors we considered the heart of the system, secret, so to, so to speak because it's controlling the pressure loss across the injector. And this is why it's been exceedingly difficult to show pressure gain because those losses are enough to eat up all the gains that you get from the combustion. Well, Doug and I figured out a little bit of a loophole without actually crossing over the eye tower boundary. And we learned that mixedness is a transportable quantity. So concocted this uh, transport equation and stuffed it into the CFD model where we could model um, the mixing rate, uh, this D omega DT, uh, and the amount of premix that we have. So the model on the top is 100% premix, hydrogen, air, and the mixing rate is essentially instantaneous. Uh, so it's our perfect um, uh, well behaved, it's domesticated and house broken uh, rotating detonation. Um, you can see all the major features. What I'm here actually is the gradient of pressure. So it looks a little bit different than the uh, pressure difference. But you can see all manner of little detail, little verbals moving back and forth, but it is exceedingly well behaved. When we crank up, uh, we, we slow down the mixing rate and we change the uh, initial mixing, it changes the entire character of the wave. And in uh, six models that we made, we made adjustments to all of the, these two values. Um, when we cranked up the mixing rate, or, or rather lowered the mixing rate to a, a slower mixing rate, the whole thing fell apart and failed. So this bottom animation shows that nation that's on the urge, on the edge of failure. You can see, even see uh, the slope of the detonation uh, slowly leaning over uh, against itself. And if you look closely, you see this little speckled line uh, that represents the transition boundary between the hot and the cold reactants is wandering all over the place. And the detonation follows that. So uh, there's a fairly complex mechanism that goes on that uh, when you change the mixing rate, you're going to basically shut this down at some point because you need that those reactants to, to, to mix properly. So it's just another challenge for Mother Nature. 
So if you look at the performance, uh, this is actually why we're doing this. Uh, there's a curve that shows up in the literature that everybody quotes. This paper by Heiser and Pratt uh, goes back to 2002, and they modeled a fairly simple version of a pulse detonation. Uh, that's the uh, heavy dotted line uh, in both curves. The top th set are the ideal uh, combustion uh, of the PDE, the Humphrey or constant volume cycle, and the Brayton cycle. And you can see that uh, the PDE is always more efficient than the Brayton. Uh, the left y-axis is thermal efficiency. The temperature ratio across the inlet compressor is on the bottom, and that can be translated as pressure ratio if you want. Uh, Heiser Pratt chose temperature ratio. Um, if you change the component efficiency of your precompressor, your combustion efficiency, and your expansion efficiency, uh, those curves drop to that middle set that is in the bottom. And you can see that you've lost half, roughly half of your thermal efficiency due, due to this uh, change in component efficiency. So this is, uh, as reality sets in, you're not going to get anywhere near uh, what you thought you were going to get. And in fact, this kind of curve explains why it's really difficult to break 50% in almost any thermal cycle. So those are the ideal cycles. They're all asymptotic to 100% efficiency if you go up uh, high enough in your temperature ratio. And you'll notice that the PDE and the Brayton cycles cross at a temperature ratio in this curve at about four. But this crossing is disputed. There's some assumptions in the model that we take issue with. So I wouldn't take that crossing all that seriously. What you have to realize, though, is that the difference between the PDE and the RD and the Brayton cycle obviously are narrowing as you go up. So these non-ideal cycles, uh, they're all modeled with the same assumption. Uh, all things being equal, but you have to be aware in these kind of studies, all things are never equal. So you have to be aware of simple system studies like this. We can learn a few things from this graph that are very informative. Engine size tends to go with the pressure ratio or temperature ratio. So we can divide this up into two realms where uh, large engines exist to the right, and small engines exist to the left. Uh, what do I mean by large and small? Um, in the small engine range on the very end, uh, on the three sets of arrows at the top, um, you have uh, two to one. If you have a two to one compression ratio, uh, you can get roughly a hundred percent increase, uh, namely double your thermal efficiency. A two to one you could easily get out of a, uh, out of a turbocharger. Um, micro turbines tend to operate in the four to one. You could get an increase of 50% out of a micro turbine. Uh, you go up to uh, where the temperature ratio is about two, and you're getting into a number of engines that are running about 10 to one. Uh, that uh, uh, engine that the Air Force is running in their lab is in this range. And if you get up a little bit higher than that, you get up into the 20 to 1 uh, compression ratios, and you might be getting into the military engines. The large engines, I mean, like the large commercial engines, the large rockets, uh, like the space shuttle, they're way off uh, at the right end side of that curve. Um, these curves are very, very narrow. So the difference between the PDE and the RDE and the Brayton cycle engines is getting very, very small. But I learned when I was at Pratt that if you could offer the company and say, I got a gizmo I can put on the engine, I can get a 0.1 increase in the thermal efficiency. That 0.1 increase in thermal efficiency might get you a promotion because that's a big deal in, the, in these large engines that are very well developed. And they put millions and billions of dollars into getting efficiencies up to where, uh, into the low 40% range. 
So especially with the uh, like the ground power uh, engines that are running 24/7 off of natural gas, uh, a 0.1 percent um, might might be worth the development. Uh, what's interesting is on the far left side of this graph uh, that if you go down to a temperature ratio of one, that corresponds to no pre-compression. You're still getting a non-zero amount of thermal efficiency. That means that it is possible to make uh, a rotating detonation that has no pre-compression. It's self-aspirating, it will breathe on its own. The Russians have a couple of papers that they claim to have done this exact uh, thing. Whether it's actually getting this thermal efficiency, I can't vouch for that, but it says it's possible uh, to run as a standalone cycle. Uh, okay, next one. Last slide. Um, the unsolved challenges. The biggest issue is this pressure gain demonstration. We're almost there, maybe 80, 90 percent of the way toward a break-even point. Um, the problem is not so much trying to reduce the loss across the injector, as as you do that, you can destabilize the detonation. So this is a dynamic issue, uh, trying to understand this. Uh, where this injection occurs. And um, since it's ITAR, it's not going, you're not going to find much published on it uh, in the commonly available papers. You have to go to Janif or some of the other uh, classified areas, uh, which means that you're going to have a hard time getting a hold of that information. There's a whole shopping list of other challenges that have to be worked through. Um, the biggest one is related to this pressure demonstration. And until this is solved, uh, funding is going to be an issue, uh, trying to squeeze money out of the mostly the government agencies. The, the private companies are playing a wait and see um, uh, game with it, although uh, uh, Rocketdyne has done work in the past on this. And I think they're, they're still interested in this technology, so they uh, are continuing their own research. And until you get a working um, device, you have to do all of the normal stuff, the weight and cost reduction, system integration of this huge list of things that you have to solve before this is a working uh, device. So I think I've used up just about all my time and we can do questions. So can I uh, undo this thing? Uh, yes, at the top, if you, yeah, if you put your mouse uh, and scroll all the way to the top, you can yeah, um, there's... A... Okay. All right, I see what Let's happened. See. My, uh, my mouse... My mouse somehow... Using my connection on my mouse. There we go. Gotcha. Perfect. All right. So, if anyone has any questions, they can uh, raise their hand in the in the chat, and then um, we'll call on someone. We save a question. I'm not sure if we can. Is there a way to raise our hands? Oh, we actually have a question. Okay. Can you see the chat, Dr. Nordine, or do you want me to read it to you? Uh, let's see. Where's the chat? It's on the far oh, right. Okay, I see it. Would you say that introducing multiple detonation raises a uh, here we go. Okay. I'm not seeing the uh, rest of it. Okay. Raises a whole new set of difficulty. Um if what you're meaning is um, multiple detonation wave. Um, yeah, there's a whole new difficulty of analyzing it, but the wave itself under the right conditions actually will create multiple detonation waves all by itself. It's a, it's a bifurcation in my mind uh, in the dynamics. You can go from one wave to two waves to 
three waves uh, and on up, it tends to be a function of mass flow, but there are other um, factors involved. And the transition between the generation of waves is also an area of study um, to see how stable it is. So because we're, we're dealing with a very dynamic environment, the question of stability is always, always there. Uh, is that is that what the question is aimed at? Okay, good. Uh, Patrick, I see your hands raised. Do you want to go next? Hi, can can you hear me? Yes. Um, you mentioned the the cellular instability. Um, what role do you think that has and how important could that be in, in real fuels or even like far down the line biofuel uh, considerations? Um, yeah, the, um, the cellular nature, um, it, the tendency is that as you get into the heavier uh, hydrocarbon fuels, that it's harder and harder to detonate and get it to be stable. Um, the the hydrogen oxygen uh, system that I showed you there is exceedingly well behaved and is easy to detonate. Um, one of the things that happens in the chemistry is that your activation energy is going up, and and uh, that starts to play uh, a big role in the detonation. There's uh, there's a number of papers out there that have modeled the Z and D. Uh, system as a 1D model, but they've added the finite rate chemistry in the form usually of a one-step Arrhenius model, uh, which um, lumps all of the parameters into into a, into a one equation. Um, and what they've shown is that uh, as the activation energy goes up it will go through a chaotic bifurcation. And if you're familiar with chaos theory, um, uh, you know that this would go from like one, you get a period doubling, uh, you go from one period to two periods, and you start working up all of these extra uh, periods or frequencies, if you want to look at it that way, uh, up until the system is fully chaotic uh, as activation energy goes up. Um, Methane is a fairly light molecule, but it's actually rather problematic. Um, it makes for a rather messy smoke foil, and it's very difficult to get actually get a, a clear measurement of what its cellular structure actually is because it's all over the place. Um, so its chemistry is, uh, it, it's, under a lot of study, there's a lot of interest in methane as a fuel for this. The DOE uh, would love to have a rotating detonation engine running on methane. Uh, but uh, there are some issues, and that's one of them. Um, yeah, the, the chemistry does make a difference. Now, uh, having said that, anything that you can atomize, you could probably detonate. Even coal dust will detonate. Um, but uh, whether it works, it makes a good engine or not is anybody's guess. Uh, but in general, the heavier hydrocarbons um, will detonate, but it becomes increasingly more difficult to deal with them. So uh, from my standpoint, I would say this is a natural machine to work in a hydrogen economy. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, did that, um, let's see, the, the question, does the cellular in instability impact e efficiency? Um, not really, I think, but I don't, I'm not sure that that, I don't, I don't think I would have a clear answer on that. It probably does, um, and, for the reason that there is a transport equation, which I did not mention, uh, that shows that if you have 
unsteadiness in the moving frame of reference, you probably will generate entropy from that. But having said that, I think it would depend on the specific um, system that you're working with and how that works out. And I don't think anybody has a clear answer. Uh, less cells in a wavefront, um, possibly. Um, as you as you reduce the distance between the boundary conditions in the rotating detonation, uh, the detonation is bounded by the injection boundary, and then that top of the uh, 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 the fill zone. And that effectively are, creates a wall that the, uh, the detonation sits in. Uh, as you go to higher numbers of waves, that distance is going to reduce. And eventually, you're going to get down to the point where the cellular structure will not operate in a small detonation height. It just simply will fail. Uh, the theoretical limit is that if you can get down to um, half a cell size, you can still detonate. It's like a half wave uh, resonance kind of thing. Um, but uh, there's probably no margin uh, for you to operate safely in that area. Uh, I don't think the cell size directly impacts the efficiency. Uh, it's more of a stability thing. But uh, I would also guess that nearly everything in the in a dynamic system like this is connected so there there probably is a connection in some place it's a question of how big that um, impact is okay you're welcome does anyone else have any more questions Uh, actually, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, um, from the perspective of someone who really doesn't know too much about this, um, this sort of field of study, um, something I kind of remembered from watching Saturn V documentaries about the uh, F1 rockets is that they, the engineers had to face like a major combustion instability, like they had major combustion instability issues. Um, is that something that you had to face um, in sort of what kind of, like what challenges did that present you and how did yeah, you? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good story you picked up on. Um, <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's a lot of people that think that those combustion instabilities in the Saturn rockets were a detonation a, and a rotating detonation. I don't think they know specifically. Um, I do have a paper from uh, the 1960s that pretty much laid out all of the details of a rotating detonation uh, and proposed that that was what was happening in uh, the Saturn rockets. Um, the, the detonation itself, um, if you're not designing for it, it's, it's a brutal phenomenon. It can rip metal off out of the walls. Um, if you've seen the effects of uh, knocking in a in a, a gasoline engine or a diesel engine, uh, you you could you know the, that it can cause damage. Um, the um, there is an extreme acoustic uh, detonation, and the reason I know this is I uh, there's a, a video that was created by the people at Air Force where they put a glass tube around the detonation. And they can get some very good movies of the wave as it goes around um, and, and until, the, until the glass or the plastic uh, falls apart. Uh, you can get enough uh, information. And what they captured was a rather remarkable um, sequence where they basically lit the uh, gas flow off with a small flame at the exit and basically treated it like a Bunsen burner. The flame is in the tube. And you can see uh, particles going by. And then in this tube, you can see this disturbance going around the tube, very subtle disturbance. And every time it comes around in the tube, it gets a little bit stronger. And it took only maybe a half a dozen uh, revolutions before 
it developed into a full-fledged uh, detonation. Uh, and there's some people that said, oh, look at that. Um, we didn't talk about how to start one of these things. The, um, the traditional way of starting uh, an RDE is with a PDE, is to put a tube on the side of the chamber and shove a detonation wave into the uh, annulus, and that actually kickstarts the whole thing to go. Uh, they, people started out putting the tubes in tangentially. It turns out that it doesn't matter that much. You can run the tube in at, uh, even uh, tangentially, and you find out that the wave actually turned around and went the other way that you thought it was going to do. So uh, the direction of the wave um, is also uh, a matter of study. But it, it turns out that uh, you could actually start this with a very weak uh, flame. Uh, and what some people have taken to doing is rather than putting a, a drilling a hole in the side of the chamber and putting a tube in there, they've actually taken a flexible pipe and just pointed it at the back end and started it that way. Uh, the way it figures it out, it's very smart and it knows what it wants to do. Uh, but the stability is uh, is related. That, that Saturn V instability is undoubtedly a cousin to the rotating detonation. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, something popped up here. Uh, do you think your research reveals anything about where RDEs may most likely be used? First stage of rocket, second stage of rocket aircraft. Um, Great question. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I One area that I've thought that it might prove itself is in hypersonics. Um, but the hypersonics guys have a lot of money invested in their current system. But there is some work looking at using an RDE uh, for hypersonics. And there is a thermodynamic argument that says that this would be a good idea. And surprisingly enough, um, part of that argument has to deal with stability. Um, the hypersonic people apparently have a challenge in stability themselves where they have to uh, deal with a condition which is called unstart, um, where if you choke the back end of your hypersonic engine, you'll blow out the front end of the, of the inlet and everything will go to hell. So there's, there's some real dynamic issues in just doing that sort of cycle. And there are some people that think that the RTE might actually solve that problem. Um, the, the rocket, um, we have one researcher, uh, Chipping Lee, who runs uh, a lot of the Air Force research, uh, and he's put forth uh, sort of a hierarchy of uh, difficulty for any of this. And he says, we do rockets first because that's simpler, then we do gas turbines, then we'll do hypersonics. Well, events are catching up to us, and the Russians and the Chinese are working on this as well. So. Um, as a priority thing, I think we're working on everything right now. Uh, my take on it is based on that Heiser Pratt curve is that the best application might be in small engines because you get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of efficiency. Uh, so if you had like a gas turbine where the compressor was you know, say two to one, four to one uh, compression ratio, say a very good turbocharger kind of machine, uh, you could get that up to a thermal efficiency that would be competitive with piston engines. So that is very interesting to me. Now, as you go up in size, you go up in pressure ratio and you go through that, uh, as those two curves are going to, uh, come closer to each other, and your um, your marginal benefit is going to diminish. But there's other things that you have to look at when you design these systems, and one is um, weight. Can you make this 
uh, device smaller and simpler than what is already there. So even if it's the same efficiency or even a little bit less, it might be worth it. But this is requires a fairly complex system study to get all that to work. Um, I don't know that anybody has the answers to this question, but it's it's has to be answered at some point. All of this is not easy. Uh, like I said, it's not easy being real. Uh, it's going to take work, and uh, from another perspective, it's more work for everybody, and we can stay employed. Anybody else? Uh, I have another question, actually. So moving away from the you know combustion and engine uh, aspect of it, what is one piece of advice that you'd give to us as, uh, I guess, future engineers? Ah, uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, you want to ask the hard questions. Um, follow your passion. If you are interested in it, it'll make it easier for you, even if it's a difficult subject. Uh, if you want, you have to want to do this. Uh, in fact, if you signed up for any of this uh, graduate, uh, if you're going to go all the way to uh, a PhD, uh, you must have figured out by now that you really have to want to do it. Um, it's uh, so finding what you want to work on is probably uh, what you have to be looking at. Um, for myself, uh, I've had an interest in uh, the thermodynamics for some time. Uh, it often does not get, you don't often find a way to work on something like this in industry because they are generally interested in maintaining their current product line. So if you wind up in industry, you often wind up on working on a lot of detail stuff. Um, you, you're probably not going to make any great discovery in industry because they don't do that much research. Uh, they wait for the universities and the government labs to come up with interesting things. And then they, they watch and they wait, and at some point they say, oh, yeah, we can put some money in this. We think it'll work. With RDEs, we're, um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we don't have the, the, the pressure gain yet, uh, so it's it's still a wait and see game. Personally, uh, I've run into any number of people that have had this issue, and it's it's a hard question to ask. Read as much as you can, look everywhere you can, find something that you want to do, and then maybe you can get funding for it. Now. Having said that, if something comes your way and somebody says, we have this one problem and we're willing to pay uh, your research, uh, your, your grant money, um, you have to think twice before you turn it down. So that's, that's a hard thing. But you have to find your opportunities where they are. I, I think I was lucky. Um, when I first started this, uh, I did not have the grant. I left Pratt thinking I would try to figure out how to do this. Um, as it turned out, uh, I knew enough people, and um, I knew Fred Chower at uh, uh, at the Air Force. And um, what what actually happened was we made a proposal to build an operating RDE at UConn, and we wanted to put a glass wall around it and take pictures of it high-speed pictures, and we put in for a grant at DARPA. And DARPA, which was running an RDE detonation program at the time, looked at it and said, um, it's not commercial enough. They wanted something that was further along than simply something like that. They said, um, this is too academic for us. Go talk to the Air Force. So we got forwarded to uh, Shower and Company. And uh, he came down to Yukon and he says, well, that's an interesting idea. But 
we don't really understand the cycle. And I said, what? I said, all these Russian papers and everything, and you don't understand the cycle? He says, no, we don't have a good cycle. So that's what was offered to me at the time, is to go off and model the cycle, which we did. And as it turned out, um, I didn't know at the time, uh, but Fred told me later that even though the rotating detonation had been modeled as a ZND uh, model years ago uh, by the Russians and the team at Michigan, um, which there's a connection there with Ali Deborah. He was doing his graduate work at the time. He was not part of that specific team, but uh, Ali Deborah is a Yukon emeritus. Um, uh, was at Michigan at the same time, and he has an inter had an interest, as I mentioned, in the detonation. Uh, but in the Air Force, there was a disagreement over how the RDE actually worked, and there were some people that said, oh, it's a standing wave inside the tube. But they didn't have a working RDE, so they didn't have anything to study, and uh, there wasn't enough information out there to really nail the cycle. So there's a lot of disagreement. So Fred said, do you want to work on the cycle? I said, great. We don't have a lab anyway to, to, to build. I was hoping that we could build something, but it didn't happen. So we went off and uh, I wound up in the position I'm in right now. So um, you can want to do a particular thing all you want, but I wouldn't turn down money. Uh, unless there was uh, some other thing that you really, really wanted to do more than money. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Okay, get another uh, question here. Uh, okay, do you think your research reels, reveals anything? Oh, no, that's the, uh, we did that. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions? Great opportunity to, uh, I guess, take the mind of someone who's been <laughs> in the industry for a while. So this is, uh, this is really, really fascinating. Thank you again. You're welcome. Going once, going twice. All right. Um, I think that that might uh, wrap to wrap it up. Is that? Thank you so much, Dr. Nardine. Really appreciate yeah. you. Uh, if you want to email me, uh, uh, I'd be happy to take whatever questions you want to send in an email. So uh, you're welcome. Uh, this has been fun. Do you want me to send out your email to the participants, or? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, sure. I'll send, up a, I'll send out a follow-up email and everything, and those who are interested can contact you. All right, just like everyone in the chat, thank you so much. Really appreciate um, it. If you want to actually stick around, uh, we're going to be taking a picture for our website, and if you want to be part of the picture, I guess we're going to be taking like a screenshot of everyone, so if you want to turn on your cameras, then, I mean, if you want to be on the, in the, in the website, so... We'll just have like a, I guess, a family moment. <laughs> Somebody's got some great backgrounds there. These ones about uh, AI double A. <laughs> right, cool. Almost there. Let's try to flip the screen, maybe. We need a couple more. We just want like a. I guess a giant panel of, of all the future engineers. Did you get a count of how many uh, has come? Um, I saw it top out at like 120. So wow. yeah, I believe so, yeah. yeah. Wow. Almost there. Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, wait, actually, I think part of it. Oh, wait, no, actually, I think everyone is on the front page. All right, I'm not sure if we'll get, <laughs> we'll get the full amount. All right, um, 
Um, do, should we just take it? Anyone want to do like a Yukon Husky? Anybody want to do that? <laughs> All right, I got it. You got it? All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, thanks, everyone. All right, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, have a good evening. Okay, good night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Nordinus. It was uh, really, really fascinating. Yeah, thank you.